In this video, we'll be reviewing the final hand of an epic series from the Triton High Stakes Cash Game in Montenegro. This hand between Tony G and Mikita Bajikowski was requested by many of you, but initially I was reluctant to analyze it since it starts out multi-way, which PO Solver cannot process. However, given that in reality, we will often find ourselves in multi-way spots, considering what adjustments should be made to the baseline GTO strategies when playing against more than one opponent, I think is worth exploring. Easy. Easy money. <laughs> Twenty-two. Uh, no. Give you a chance to get some refund okay. if you can get lucky. Just move all in. Hold to Tony G. They want to qualify. We do like a big all in hand. Just, we'll be cool. Uh, the three of us like move all in with random hands. <laughs> so the action folds around to Tony G in the small blind. He raises 2.5x the straddle with King 9 off, and both Ike and Makita call. In previous videos from this series, we used range converters poker master ranges, which provide for both an ante and a straddle. However, given that these ranges call for a much larger small blind open of 5.3x the straddle, for this sim, we will instead be using ranges for a 50 big blind game without a straddle, since the raise size relative to the pot for this sim is closer to Tony's actual sizing. And for convenience sake, we will be giving both Ike and Makita identical big blind ranges from this solution. Obviously this will not be exactly accurate, but given the pot odds, I think this should be somewhat reasonable. Very last hand, Tony G with top pair. Gonna fire out. Haxon's got middle pair and Bodzikowski bottom pair. The flop comes Jack King seven, and Tony continues with a 29% pot bet. So given that PO Solver only provides heads up solutions, we're gonna make a few adjustments to do our best to approximate the optimal strategies for a multi-way scenario. First, at each decision node. We're going to run a sim between the applicable player to act and the immediately preceding aggressor, but adjust effective stacks and pot sizes to account for the multi-way action. Secondly, we're going to use Equilab to see how the equities might be effective given that there are three instead of two players. This approach will not be perfect, and multi-way Nash equilibria is not currently known, but given that the creators of Pluribus also used a modified version of their heads-up algorithm to beat some of the top players in the world in 6 max, hopefully this protocol will at least be directionally accurate. So this solution shows Tony G's strategy in the small blind against Ike in the big blind, and we see that the solver is betting this sizing for most of its range, as this board is favorable to the preflop aggressor. And we see that Tony's particular holding, King 9 off, is also primarily betting here, and that it is quite strong against a weak big blind range with around 80% equity. However, since we're multi-way, we also need to consider how adding Makita into the mix should impact Tony's strategy. Taking a look at Equilab, we see that when Makita is not in the equation, the calculated equities are quite close to PO Solver. So what happens when we add Makita on the button? Well, we see that the equity for King 9 drops pretty significantly, around 15 percentage points. And this shows how, in multi-way scenarios, the equities of individual holdings are generally depressed due to the fact that introducing additional opponents increases the probabilities that Hero is currently behind or will be outdrawn in later streets. However, since King 9 is still significantly favored to win here, betting in this spot to extract value and perhaps isolate against one opponent makes some sense. One call from Haxton. 
Ike calls the second pair and we see that Pio agrees. Taking a look at Equilab, we see again that its calculated equity is quite close to Pio Solver. However, when we add Makita's assumed range acting behind, we see that Ike's second pair immediately becomes much more marginal at around 49%. In the context of a heads-up scenario, this equity profile is similar to bottom pair, which still does call given that any made hand against a small blind's wide range after a small bet is relatively strong. Makita has seen Tony G make a lot of bluffs, random stabs. So there's a chance he thinks a 7 is good occasionally, as long as haxton has got some straight draws. He's going to continue as well. He's got position. So this solution shows Makita's strategy in the straddle versus Tony's raise, and also takes into account Ike's call in the pot size. We see that Pio views this as a clear call with bottom pair in a two-person game. From a probability standpoint, we see that Pio shows 50% equity for this holding, which is again similar to what Equilab shows in a heads-up scenario. However, when we add Ike into the mix, we see that Makita's equity drops to around 36%, which is still in the range of calling according to Pio, however this is a closer decision. On the one hand, Makita has a positional advantage and the price he's getting given Ike's call is very enticing. However, on the other hand, this board does not favor Makita's range and Ike's call significantly increases the likelihood that Makita is behind at least one if not both of the players with his bottom pair. A complete blank Tony G is reaching for a lot of chips. 70,000 euros, half the pot. He's got the best hand. His image has really been paying off. The turn is the deuce of diamonds and Tony barrels, increasing the bet to 54% of pot. Interestingly, we see that the solver is betting king nine, but it favors the larger 150% sizing against Ike's wide big blind range. Here, the equities shown by Pio and Equilab are virtually identical when heads up, but when we add Makita into the mix, we see that Tony's equity drops to around 74%. This equity profile is more in the vicinity of a strong second pair, and we do see the solver doing a bit more checking with these combos, and when it does bet, it utilizes the smaller 25% pot sizing. Out of position against two callers, the value of Tony's top pair with the weaker kicker is somewhat diminished multi-way, so tampering down the aggression may be the more preferable line in this context. There's no flush draws. So both Hacks and Bozikowski really only beat straight draws from Tony G, but then again, Tony G's been betting random hands, so just be like a 5-4 offsuit. Haxon's gonna fold one of them, but now it's on Bozikowski. Ike folds, and we see that according to Pio, in a heads-up matchup, the solver is primarily calling here. However, this is the first instance where we see a pretty significant break between the equities calculated by Pio and Equilab heads-up. This may be due to the fact that in Equilab, we are continuing to use Tony G's and Ike's initial starting ranges, whereas Pio is calculating the equities based on Tony G's remaining range that has now barreled twice and therefore will be much stronger than his starting range as a number of his weaker holdings have been cleaved off. Also, Pio is calculating the equities based on Ike's remaining range as well, which flatted on the flop, meaning that we can remove some of his stronger holdings that would have raised. If we experiment with adjusting Ike's equity by subtracting 10-20% to 20 to take into account that we are multi-way, that would put his equity profile in the range of some of these lower pairs and ace highs, some of which are folding in this spot. A very weak pair. And a lot of tension going on. Tony G is actually quite silent in this hand. Might be going through Bodzikowski's mind. Wow, it is going to call here a third pair, 270,000 euros in the middle. So with Ike out of the way, Makita calls and we see that Pio is also calling here and is even calling with bottom pair. 
However, although Tony's small blind opening range should be relatively wide, which would justify a looser call, we should keep in mind that the solver does not take into account the fact that Tony is barreled twice out of position into two opponents, so this is something that should be noted from Makita's standpoint. Whatever card small is the profit. eight. Okay, do that profit. It's like a lot of lost two hundred grand. Tony G is hmm? still value betting. Top pair, a nine kicker, 120,000 euros. The river is the eight of diamonds, and Tony is unrelenting with a third barrel, this time firing a 44% pot bet. So apparently Tony is a secret GTO wizard, because according to Pio, this sizing is utilized by nearly 100% of these king nine combos against Makita's wide range, which will have a number of weaker pairs in this spot. What's crossing Baze Kelsey's mind is that this is the very last hand, and maybe Tony G is trying to make a play to kind of rub it in his face after. And Tony G is completely silent. Kita beats Queen 10, Ace Queen, and pretty much just any random hands. 10 9 did get there. Does also beat Queen 9. You can sleep for 7 hours. But there's a lot of hands that beat him. Any King, Makita reaching for chips. Raises to 400,000. Wow, what a sick play. Yeah. So Makita decides to raise with his low pair, bumping it up 3.3x Tony's bet. As we can see, the solver is primarily folding Queen 7 off. However, interestingly, we do see the solver is raising with a number of other similar weak pairs. So how is the solver deciding to fold, call, or raise with these hands that are largely indistinguishable strength-wise? Well, in my last few videos, I've been previewing elements of the GTO Check Blueprint, which is a system designed to both assist with understanding solver solutions, as well as to serve as a framework for real-time hand analysis. The blueprint is structured in three sequential levels. The macro analysis, which focuses on analyzing the tendencies of Hero's entire range. The meso analysis, which focuses on analyzing the tendencies for Hero's hand class and the microanalysis, which focuses on the characteristics of Hero's specific hand. We've previously discussed both the macroanalysis and methoanalysis at length, so today we'll be exploring the microanalysis. The microanalysis is the last, most fine-grained level of examination, and focuses on the equity-altering characteristics of Hero's specific holding, namely draws both front door and back door, blockers and unblockers. These elements significantly influence solver strategies as they provide Hero with additional information unknown to Villain that can change the probabilities of the game state. As such, these microanalysis elements often serve as a deciding factor between different strategies when the EVs are close. And this differentiation is necessary because using a pure strategy for all combos in the same class for a close decision will often result in a severe imbalance. For example, in this case with Tony's wide small blind range, he should have a number of bluffs here, so to avoid being exploited, Makita will need to defend relatively wide as well when facing a small or medium sized bet, including with some marginal hands such as some of these weaker pairs. However, we see that this is the most prevalent segment in Makita's range, so all of these combos cannot be played with the same strategy or else Makita will be unbalanced. Right, some of these combos will need to call or else Makita will be overfolding, some of these combos will need to fold or else Makita will be over defending, and some of these combos will need to raise or else Makita will not have sufficient bluffs to balance his range. So how does GTO allocate these strategies in this scenario? Well, primarily, this decision is driven by the microanalysis attributes, namely blockers and unblockers, and the GTO check blueprint uses the following approach to help guide our implementation of these attributes. Step one is to identify the relevant positive and negative microattributes for hands in Hero's class. Step two is to evaluate whether Hero's specific hand possesses predominantly positive or negative microattributes. 
The more positive microattributes Hero's hand possesses, the more inclined Hero should be to call, bet, or raise as applicable. The more negative microattributes Hero's hand possesses, the more inclined Hero should be to give up. And if Hero's hand possesses a mix of negative and positive microattributes, making the optimal decision unclear or mixed, Step 3 is to utilize a randomizer or exploitative considerations. So for step 1, the first thing we need to do is evaluate both the strongest and weakest holdings in villain's range that may have taken Tony's line. In this case, the strongest possible holding is the 9-10 straight, and the weakest holdings consist of these missed queen x straight draws and some weaker ace highs. In that context, holding a 9 or 10, which blocks the straight, and not holding a queen or ace, which unblock Tony's bluffs, are positive micro-attributes. And conversely, holding a queen or ace, which blocks Tony's bluffs, is a negative micro-attribute. So focusing on Makita's weak pairs, we indeed see that most of the hands with predominantly positive micro-attributes, namely with a 9 or 10, and without a queen or ace, are primarily defending with either a call or a raise. The hands with predominantly negative micro-attributes, namely these queen x and ace x combos, are folding, and the combos which unblock Tony's ace and queen high bluffs, but do not carry the 9x or 10x blocker, such as these lower pocket pairs and suited combos, are mixing between calling and folding. So Makita's particular holding, queen 7 off, is ranked near the bottom of this class because it does not have any positive micro-attributes as it does not possess a 9 or 10, and instead it does have a negative micro-attribute since it contains a queen. Accordingly, we see the solver primarily just folding this paired 7, even over hands that have a lower rank such as deuce 9, deuce 10, and some of these weaker pocket pairs. So what is Makita thinking with this play? Well, I'm sure that Makita is fully familiar with blockers and unblockers, so if I had to guess, this is likely a pure exploitative play. With Tony's third barrel, Makita has apparently recognized that he's likely behind at this point, and therefore instead of bluff catching, he decides to turn his low pair into a bluff. He may have determined that Tony G was opening too wide, which is true, and then perhaps he made an exploitative adjustment to punish Tony's weak range, which given his relatively loose play, may have arrived at the river with a paired jack or eight. Can Tony G make the call here of just top pair, no kicker? Oh. While well, he snap calls pretty much on the very last hand. I'm the best, the best. Yes! The best! <laughs> yes! The best! Wow. Brolux. He bluffed me, huh? The Belarusian, huh? Not good enough for me in cash games, buddy. I'm gonna destroy you! Nice head. Why you bluff me? You got a seven? Get a queen. He get a queen, he, he get me. I pay. Huh? You bluff me? No. Yana. We're going shopping, buddy. Shopping, beautiful, okay, nice jet. No Thank you. So Tony makes the call, and we see that the solver is predominantly calling with king nine as well. Obviously, holding the nine is nice since it blocks the possible straights in Makia's range. But if I had to guess, given the speed of Tony's call and his apparent semi-drunken state, this GTO mumbo jumbo probably didn't even cross his mind, and he likely made the call based on some combination of the strength of his hand look in Makita's eye, and a general distrust of Belarusians. Now I don't want to be too result oriented, and Makita would have looked like a genius if this move had worked, however anecdotally, it seems that the times I personally have punted the most had been in situations similar to this one where I made an incorrect read and took a line I would not have otherwise taken in a vacuum. Perhaps my reading skills just suck, but this is why the GTO check blueprint only takes into account exploitative considerations at the very end of the analysis after the GTO strategy is unclear or mixed, which will be quite often. So for example, with a hand like 9-7, we see that the solver is doing some folding, some calling, and some raising. While you could make a decision in this spot using a randomizer, it may be actually more effective to instead focus on exploitative considerations if present. But no matter which method you choose, you will not be losing significant EV because you'll still be within the confines of GTO. 
However, taking a line which diverges from a pure GTO strategy will often lose significant EV and is generally not recommended for less experienced players because once you start to deliberately veer away from the GTO game tree, it can be very difficult to objectively and systematically calibrate your overall frequencies, which is necessary to avoid becoming imbalanced. So that's the video for today. Thanks for watching, and until next time, stay balanced. You're